So tonight, if, if, you, if, you, if you agree with me, I will focus on Deleuze, and during the discussion we can, of course, address uh, all the questions you want to connect with these questions. Uh, so uh, everything I'm going to say uh, will be, first of all, uh, a tribute to Gilles Deleuze, to his work. Uh, that is, first of all, a sign of, a sign of an old and lasting admiration, respect and friendship. Um, I would like to remark, uh, uh, before I, I start to refer to difference and repetition, There is a, 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 a new discussion of translation. Uh, refer to a translation because we will we'll meet, we will encounter a number of problems with translation. The title of this, this lecture first is uh, contains a problem of translation. In French, I would have called this la bêtise transcendantale de l'homme et le devenir animal selon de l'ouse. But the translation of Betis in English is absolutely, and uh, here we have a witness, uh, for that is absolutely impossible. You can't translate Betis uh, in English uh, fully and, and, and authentically. So I would say the transcendental stupidity of man and the becoming animal according to the rules. So he, in his translation of uh, difference and repetition. Paul Patton, who is an Australian philosopher and a, an expert in Deleuze, um, in the chapter entitled, the chapter in difference and repetition, entitled The Image of Thought, Image de la Pensée, um, he, um, Paul Patton is very vigilant in his translation because Everything will turn today around a French word, a French lexicon that I, I consider untranslatable, as I said, bet, bete. And for reasons we could unfold for hours, there are no English words, especially not stupid or stupidity, and not even dumb or dumbness that adequately translate bet or bete. Even within the borders of the French idiom, there is no stable semantic context that could univocally guarantee a safe translation from one pragmatic use to of bet or bêtise uh, in a given context to another one, into another one. So, being aware of that, Paul Patton, the translator of the race, twice keeps the words bêtise and bet in French, in uh, square brackets, when he writes, translating Deleuze, I quote him, stupidity, and bêtise in square brackets, is not animality. La bêtise n'est pas l'animalité. Bête ne veut pas dire animal. So, stupidity is not animality. And, and Paul Patton quotes the French word because he, he understands it's not a, 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 a full and sufficient translation. <coughs> stupidity is not uh, the best translation of it. Stupidity is not animal. Thing. The animal in the Gazon is protected by specific forms which prevent it from being bad, stupid. The animal is protected, protected by specific forms which prevent it from being bet. So the animal, l'animal n'est jamais bet. Bet se dit seulement de l'homme. It's only man who can be bet, stupid, never the animal. And the Lord himself put the word bet within quotation marks. Of course, having put the word in square brackets, Paul Patton then uses the word stupidity without mentioning all the time, but is again. The reader having been <coughs> warned once and for all that stupidity is supposed to translate betise, there will be no further harm. 
And this will be the case, for instance, for the major question that is asked, which is, I quote first the French in the text, comment la bêtise et non l'erreur est-elle possible? Comment la bêtise et non l'erreur est-elle possible? How is stupidity, not error, possible? And this will be then my point of departure. Comment la bêtise est-elle possible? Et non l'erreur. La bêtise n'est pas l'erreur. I'm now going to select some pieces of the seminar I mentioned uh, on the list and the sovereign. Um, although I'll have, of course, to skip many developments for a lot of time. Uh, beyond uh, uh, sexual difference, the article in France, la, le, la bête et le souverain. In French, we say la bête et le souverain, the beast, the sovereign, very well indicates that it has to do with some, with common names, common nouns, such that it does not have to do with adjectives or attributes, la bête et le souverain, pas la bêtise et la souveraineté, ou être bête et être souverain, mais la bête et le souverain. And um, the distinction is all the more critical in uh, that it recalls two pieces of evidence probably linked to the <coughs> idiomatic use of the French language. One would never say of la bête that it is bête or bestial. A French speak speaker would never say la bête est l'animal est bête ou la bête est bête ou, ou, ou est uh, bestial. So l'homme peut être bête ou bestial. Only man can be bête or bestial. Um, so, uh, the adjective, the attribute, bad, bestial, stupid, dumb, is never appropriate to the animal or the beast. So, bêtise is proper to man. Quel est le propre de l'homme? La bêtise. La bêtise est le propre de l'homme. Est un des propres de l'homme. Or, to the sovereign as man. So, the sovereign may be bad. And we have a number of examples today in history. How bad is the head of state, maybe. Uh, later on, I'll come back to the latest text in difference and repetition of the subject precisely of bêtise as essential to or appropriate to man. Of course, everyone knows, the, I hope so, the very rich chapter in uh, A Thousand Plateaus, uh, Mil, Mil Plateau, entitled Becoming Intense, Becoming Animal, Becoming Imperceptible. Becoming Intense, Becoming Animal, Becoming Imperceptible. That's the title of the uh, famous chapter. One finds there are no, not only references to the wolf, and I must mention the fact that during the first year of this seminar on the beast and the sovereign, the wolf was a main main character, so to speak, coming back from everywhere, again and again and again. So we, the, the, the seminar was full of wolves all the time, <laughs> and of text on wolves and so Number of them. So, not only there are references to the wolf in, in Deleuze's uh, uh, chapter, <coughs> and the wolf man, the man whom the wolves look like, but also references to the werewolf, le loup-garou in French, the werewolf, uh, and to the phenomenon of children wolf, uh, wolf children, mm -hmm. the and the be becoming whale of Haha in Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. One finds there too among the, the thousand plateau, many other things, the question of taxonomy, classification, the question of animal figures. And in passing, Deleuze notes psychoanalysis. And he laughs at psychoanalysis. When psychoanalysis speaks about animals, he laughs at it, as he often does. 
uh, to me sometimes a little too quickly, but not only does he laugh at it, he also tells us, which is even uh, funnier, that the animals themselves laugh at psychoanalysis <laughs> when psychoanalysis speaks about them. I quote, Regulus, in translation, we must distinguish three kinds of animals. First, individuated animals, family pets, sentimental, edible animals, each with its own petty history, my cat, my dog. These animals invite us to regress, draw us into a narcissistic contemplation, and they are the only kind of animal psychoanalysis understands. The better to dis discover a daddy, a mommy, a little brother behind him, when, and then the parenthesis by the list, when psychoanalysis talks about animals, animals, animals learn to laugh. That's page 240 here in the He then Hegel then adds in italics, I quote, anyone who likes cats or dogs is a fool. Fool is the translation for con, <laughs> which is as untranslatable as bet. <laughs> Tous ceux qui aiment les chats et les chiens sont des cons. And then he goes on, there is a second kind, animals with characteristics or attributes, genus classification, or state animals. Animals as they are treated in the great divine myth in such a way as to extract from them series of structures, archetypes, or models. Jung is in any event profounder than Freud." Unquote. That's also the absolute originality in France, admiring Jung more than <laughs> Freud. He's probably the only, the only uh, philosopher or the only French uh, citizen who <laughs> <laughs> uh, thinks that Jung is profounder than, than, that Jung is profounder than Freud. And he goes on, I quote again at length, finally, there are more demonic animals, pack or affect animals that form a multiplicity, a becoming, a population, a tail, or once again, cannot any animal be treated in all three ways? There is always the possibility that a given animal, a louse, a cheta, or an elephant, will be treated as a pet, my little beast. And at the other extreme, it is also possible for any animal to be treated in the mode of pack or swarm. That is our way, fellow sorcerers. Even the cats, even the dog, and the shepherd, the animal trainer, the devil, may have a favorite animal in the pack, although not at all in the way we were just discussing. Yes, any animal is or can be a pack but to varying degrees of vocation that make it easier or harder to discover the multiplicity of multiplicity grade <coughs> an animal contains, actually or virtually according to the case. Schools, bands, herds, populations are not inferior social forms. They are affects and powers, involutions that grip every animal in a becoming just as powerful as that of the human being with the animal, and of course. Of course, the question that explicitly or indirectly traverses the whole seminar to which I refer is that is what is proper to man. Quel est le propre de l'homme? On the other hand, whether it's characterized as a perversion of sexual, sexual deviation, zoophilia, which compels making love with beasts, or making love to beasts, or whether it's characterized as cruelty, 
this bestiality, this double bestiality, hmm? zoophilic or cruel, being zoophilic or cruel, double bestiality, also would be the proper of man. Zoophilia or cruelty. Bestiality is the proper of man. That is something I study in detail in another part of this seminar in relation to black art. Now, to save time, I'll skip a long series of reflections on the French use of the word bet, <coughs> of the word bêtise, and the critical reading of Lacan on bestiality as essentially human and related to the law. Uh, this has been, uh, this uh, passage of the seminar on Lacan and the animal has been translated into English in, in critical inquiry, I think, under the title. Uh, uh, Say the animal responded. And here I so <coughs> as I said earlier, uh, uh, Lacan uh, defining bestiality as essentially human and related to the law, calling for responsibility and not for reaction. Again, this uh, this problematic opposition to responsibility and reaction. Here I'll simply note that Lacan opposes responsibility and reaction, reaction being essentially animal, response and responsibility being human. So for this tradition, what is proper to the beast or the animal would be neither bestiality nor betise or stupidity or dumbness. Now then, the question, how is la betise? Or bestiality? Possible. How is that possible? If it's not animal, if it's human. How is that possible? Comment la bêtise est-elle possible? That's la bêtise est non erreur. That's the loser's question. This question will have been raised, of course, in this form or another form by many people. However, the loser's gave it a certain form in the text I mentioned a moment ago, Indifference and Reputation, which is, as you know, 12 years older than uh, New Plateau, older than the chapter from which I just read, namely Becoming Intense, Becoming Animal, Becoming Imperceptible. In New Plateau, <coughs> which devotes so many analyses to the becoming animal, the Leuze no longer refers to betis, la betis, the way he does in different and repetition. The only occurrence of the word betis, at least that I found, concerned precisely a certain betis of psychoanalysis, which you're supposed to know, the stupidity of psychoanalysis, the stupidity of betis that psychoanalysis says when it addressed that the when it addresses the question of masochism and more generally when it speaks about animals. We wish, the Deleuze says, we wish to make a simple point about psychoanalysis. From the beginning, it has often encountered the question of the becoming animals of the human being. Becoming animals of the human being. Okay. The becoming animal is human, is part of the human being. I interrupt my, my quote here just to note that for psychoanalysis, as for Deleuze, when he objects to psychoanalysis from that point of view, it is always a question of humanity, of man, of the becoming animal of man, of the history and histories of man in its or in their becoming animal. In other words, it's a question of the becoming anthropomorphically animal of man and not a question of the animal or the beast if one might, if one uh, may say themselves not a question uh, Deleuze in this text is not interested in the animal himself itself but in the becoming animal of man <coughs> And he says, I quote, we wish 
to make a simple point about psychology. From the beginning, it has often encountered the question of the becoming animal of the human being in children who continually undergo becomings of this kind, in fetishism, and in particular, masochism, which continually confront this problem. The least that can be said is that the psychoanalysts, even young, even young, excuse me, even young, did not understand and did not want to understand, even young, who is profounder than <laughs> even young, did not understand and did not want to understand. So Deleuze insinuates that all these psychoanalysts denied or, or denigrated understanding. They acted as if they didn't understand. They wanted not to understand something that consequently they understood very well. And they have some interest in not assuming, in not confessing, in not declaring that they were understanding. So they were understanding what they were understanding and wanted not to understand, <coughs> as if they were not understanding, which is a symptom more than a simple non-knowledge. <coughs> it's a symptom, symptomatic misrecognition, miscognition, or symptomatic misrecognition. It's a, more than that, it's a mistreatment. It's a mistreatment, that is, a cruel and violent mistreatment of the becoming animal of man and child. Cruel violence. Cruel violence. And the rest goes on. They killed, the translation says, in fact, it is they massacred. They massacred. They massacred. They killed the becoming animal in the adult as in the child. They saw nothing. They see the animal as a representative of drives or a representative of the parents, which is obviously the case. I mean, the wolf is the father and so on and so forth. They do not see the reality of a becoming animal that is that it is affect in itself, the drive in the person, and represents nothing represents nothing. The, 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 the sin of psychoanalysis is always representation, the, the, the relying on representation. This thing represents, this animal represents the father, represents the mother, and so on. The, 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 uh, the becoming animal is affect in itself, the drive in the person, and represents nothing, the other says. And he goes on, there exists no other drives than the assemblage themselves. Les assemblages humains, unquote. This concept of affect, like the concept of machine or assemblage and of plan or plane, le plan. How do you say plan? Plan or plane or plan? plan. And the concept of machine or assemblage or plan is, as you know, the, the central concept of the analysis and of all the Deleuzean strategy. And after some lines on the becoming horse of little Hans with Freud, and the becoming cock of Arpad with Ferenczi, Deleuze approaches the interpretation of masochism. And it is at this point that the word bêtise is imposed on him in order to qualify the discourse of the psychoanalytic type. He says, I quote, psychoanalysis has no feeling for unnatural participations, nor for the assemblage, assemblages or assemblage of child a child can mount in order to solve a problem from which all exits are barred him. Unquote. So here Deleuze is criticizing the idea of a phantasm as a natural representative, an indication of a deeper and natural drive for which Deleuze want to substitute the more technical or less natural 
more mechanistic figure of the plan, the play. The assemblage and the, the plan, the first <laughs> figure of the plane, are always involved in this discourse. And Deleuze, Deleuze goes on precisely with the word stupidity, bêtise, concerning here, consistent here in believing in the profundity, in the depths of the fantasy. There was there is only flat plane. So the the, the, the bêtise, the stupidity consists in depth, in, in believing in, in the depth of the, uh, in the in the profundity of the fantasy. Whereas there is no profundity of the fantasy, there is only a flat uh, space, uh, superficial and flat plane. I quote, psychoanalysis has no feeling for unnatural participation, nor for the assemblage a child can mount in order to solve a problem for which all exist about him. A, a plain, a plan, not a fantasy. Similar, similarly, fewer stupidities, moins de bêtises, moins de bêtises, fewer stupidities will be uttered on the topic of pain, humiliation, and anxiety in masochism if it were understood that it is the becoming animal that leads the masochism. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. There are always, it goes on, there are always apparatuses, tools, engines, engi engines involved. There are always artifices and constraints used in taking nature, nature to the fullest. That is because it is necessary to allow the organs to shut them away so that their, their liberated elements can enter into the new relations from which the becoming animal and the circulation of affects within the ma machinic, machinic, machinic? Machine. machinic assemblage will result. Page 260, 61 in the translation. <coughs> in other words, despite all these machina machinations of becoming animal that lead the man and the children <coughs> Despite the artifices that remain constraints, they affect the affect, or rather, they calculate it voluntarily. Psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts would speak fewer bêtises. They wouldn't speak stupidities about the subject of pain, humiliation, and anxiety. Anxiety, if they assume their own knowledge on the subject. So Deleuze is not saying that psychoanalysts are stupid or bad, but that mechanically their statements are stupidities. They say stupidities, it is the betis on that subject. And they define betis not only as a character, as a feature, or a state, or as the essence of what one is, but also as the effect of what one does or what one says. There are events and even operations, liberties, stupidities, there are events and operations and not a phenomenal essence. So, psychoanalysts are not stupid when they say stupidities because they know and they understand what they try not to understand what they want not to understand. They have the intelligence of what they want, what they want not to understand, for reasons to be analyzed. This <coughs> gesture and this moment, this denunciation of stupidities, despite this unique occurrence of the word betis in the Thousand Plateau, are all the more significant and strategically decisive in this book, in that not only they are inscribed in the logic of the desiring machine of the anti oedipus but also in that their necessity is announced in the very first pages of the Thousand Plateau around the concepts of rhizome and deterritorial, deterri 
to realization, which are put to the test as examples, like the wasp or the orchid. <coughs> the wasp or the orchid make rhizomes, you say rhizomes? Mm -hmm. uh, they make rhizomes, so to speak, as heterogeneous, the wasp itself becoming a piece of the apparatus of reproduction, the reproduction apparatus of the orchid, or the examples of the baboon and the virus, the DNA of the baboon and the cat, the crocodile, and so forth. In the second chapter of the Tavern Plateau, entitled 1914, that is the date of the First World War, 1914, one or several wolves, that's the title of the chapter, 1914, one or several wolves. Deleuze's sarcasm is unleashed against the treatment of the wolf mind by Freud. And there is a reference to Kafka's story, uh, Jackals and Arabs. I'll delay in citing the first sentences and the conclusion, namely an indictment, indictment of Freud, who is charged not with believing in what he was saying, which is also a machine in which he hypocritically he he pretends to believe. Rather, Freud is charged with having done everything here everything he could, and the, the indictment is here ethical and even political. Freud is charged with having done everything he could to make the patient believe in what psychoanalysis was telling him, and trying to make him subscribe to it, and to subscribe to it with another name, a name different from his own, a name becoming the name of another, the name of the father, for me, patronym. There where there was not the name of the father, there were the new name, the brand new name that he had made for himself or stole upon him. So that is the question of recognizing the test and the substitution of someone's proper name by psychoanalysis, a dispossession that motivates on the side of the Deleuze and again psychoanalysis in the name of the Wolfman, a style and logic of the complaint of the counter indictment. This is not far from looking suddenly like Arthur's discourse, Antonin Arthur's discourse on the theft of his own first name, of his new proper name in his own body which is supposed to be organless, sans organ, the corps sans organ, without organs, which means that the so-called bêtises, stupidities of psychoanalysis are not only the sign of a poverty of knowledge, that is a non-knowledge or incomprehension, but also an ethical violence, ethical violences, machines, war machines, for subjecting for stupefying, so to speak, ways of making the passions more stupid, more stupefied mm -hmm. than they are in truth. There is, <clears throat> at the beginning of this chapter, a date, at the beginning of the narrative, a series of events and Freud's analysis of the Wolfman at the time, that is, before or during the First World War. This is the sarcastic opening of the chapter 1914, one of several wolves, I quote the rules. That day, the wolfman rose from the couch particularly tired. He knew that Freud had a genius for brushing up against the truth and passing it by, or uh, then, then filling the void with associations. He knew that Freud knew nothing about wolves or answers for that matter. The only thing Freud understood was what a dog is and a dog's tail. Uh, this is an illusion, 
uh, not only to w the well-known uh, dogs of Freud, but also to those of Lacan. Lacan had also, <coughs> each was famous for having a dog. <laughs> and, and the name of Lacan will soon appear in the genealogy of psychoanalysts. <coughs> the rest goes on. It was not enough. It, would, it wouldn't be enough. The Wolfman knew that Freud would soon declare him cured, but it was not the case at all. And his treatment would continue for all eternity under Brunswick, Wolfman Brunswick, Lacan, Leclerc, etc. Which is true. <coughs> he, he's still uh, <laughs> All, all the analysts are in the analysis with him. Uh, and there it goes on. Finally, he knew that he was in the process of acquiring a veritable proper name, the Wolf Man, a name more properly his than his own, since, since it attained the highest degree of singularity in the instantaneous apprehension of a generic multiplicity, wolves. He knew that, he's, that, he's, that this new and proper name would be disfigured and misspelled, retranscribed as a patronymic. Page 26, 27. Now, before returning to difference and repetition, here is Deleuze's conclusion of the chapter 1914, one of several books. The proper name is the subject of a pure infinitive comprehended as such in a field of intensity. What Proust said about the first name, when I said Gilbert's name, I had the impression I was holding her entire body naked in my mouth. The Wolfman, a true proper name, an intimate first name linked to the becomings, infinitives, and intensities of multiplied and depersonalized individuals. What does psychoanalysis know about multiplication? The desert, the desert, excuse me, the desert hour, when the dromedary becomes a thousand dromedaries sneaking, snickering in the sky. The evening hour, when a thousand holes appear on the surface of the earth. Castration, castration right, the psychoanalysis, the psychoanalytic <laughs> scarecrow, castration, castration, <laughs> cried dog, where wolves are a domesticated individual where there are wild multiplicities. We are not just criticizing psychoanalysis for having selected edible statements exclusively, for such statements are to a certain extent part of a machinic assemblage, for which they could serve as correctional indexes, as in a calculation of errors. We are criticizing psychoanalysis for having used edible enunciation to make patients believe they would produce individual personal statements and would finally speak in their own name. Obitis as supposed as a supposed permanent feature of character and idiosyncrasy, to be distinguished from idiocy, idiosyncrasy, not idiocy. It affects a certain quality of judgment. There were the judgment, as Descartes noted, implies perception and understanding. Judgment implies, at the same time, perception and understanding, that is, intelligence and the intervention of the will. I, I, I would, uh, since you are visiting France, some of you, they, you know there have been uh, lately uh, 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 petitions, so to speak, to get to the current government, or the previous government, which is the same as the current government, <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, against what was uh, uh, called a war, war against intelligence. War against intelligence. So that's question of intelligence, uh, implying the intervention of the will, the voluntary decision, so that according to this Cartesian terminology, 
la bêtise would be at the crossroads of the finitude of the intellect and the infinity of the will. That's what the origin of the error of it to become. The, the uh, intellect is finite and the will in the man is infinite. And that this infinity of the will precipitates the judgments and provokes an error because the capacity of uh, understanding is finite. So the precipitation to judge, the excess of the will over understanding, uh, uh, over intellect, would be proper to man and would lead to bêtises, that is to say stupidity, out of precipitation, the precipitation of the will, which is disproportionate to the finitude of the understanding. That's why there is a, a visceral implication, a vertiginous one of bêtises, which in this case always touches or is touched and moved by a certain infinity of freedom in a Cartesian sense. Infinity of freedom, of will, in the Cartesian sense. So, which would mean that la bêtise de l'homme, the ability of man, implies freedom, an infinite freedom. A non-free being, non-free individual, couldn't be bad. That's why there is always a, a, a judgment uh, a value when you say, when you denounce the stability of someone say, well, uh, it's your fault. It's your fault. You're, you're guilty. You're guilty of being so bad. Uh, of course, Deleuze doesn't say this exactly in, in the same, same terms. But we'll see later on how what he says about, what he says finally about the ground, le fond, grund of bêtise. What relates bêtise to a certain abyssal depth of the ground is perhaps not unrelated to what I just suggested in the cup about freedom. You'll see why later on. In any case, this implication of a mistake in judgment, there where the judgment is not only the determining judgment that leads to the true or the not true, but the judgment of the judge, the judgment from which one expects some right, justice, justice, as well as some justice, suggests that one cannot think stupidity, which is, or at least the pragmatic use of this word, and that's what I'm interested in for the moment, without this reference. There is no pragmatic use of the word betis that wouldn't imply some obscure reference to use justice, justice. That is to the law, to the law. The immense uh, semantic abyss that follows the word, the lexical semantic family of use, justice, judge, justice, and so on and so forth. Another use, another meaning, another implication of the category of bêtise, this time, touches not only the event, but the action. The way one acts when one makes or does misdeeds, so to speak. A certain way of misdoing or the bêtise that one does. In French we say, la bêtise de quelqu'un, the stupidity of someone, Ou la bêtise que fait quelqu'un, je fais une bêtise. If I, if I uh, make a decision which is wrong, or, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, which I shouldn't have made, I would call this une bêtise, je fais une bêtise. That's what Heidegger said when he was questioned about Nazism, uh, his, his involvement did do what? Une bêtise. Je fais une bêtise. Je fais une bêtise. So, mm, not stupidity as an idiosyncratic feature, as a way of being, an exis, Aristotle, Aristotle would say, habitus, but rather as the accident of what one makes, of what one does. Je fais une bêtise. I have done the stupidity. I have made the stupidity, which is, which you, you can't say this in English. 
Et une fin qui dit, je sais, j'ai fait une bêtise. In that case, it is not that I am bad. Je peux aimer, make a bêtise without being bad. That's an accident. I made him fait une bêtise. Misdeed. But on the contrary, although I'm supposed not to be stupid, I was surprised that I made or did something stupid as in BTs. So there is always nominally or marginally but ineffaceably an insistent reference to the comprehension of meaning, if not knowledge of, of, of the object. A stubborn reference to a certain opening of meaning, intelligence, which is not simply knowledge or science. That's what accounts for the risk that is always present, always threatening to confuse stupidity and abilities with the error and illusion that it is not, to which it cannot be reduced. That's why there is the parenthesis in the list, how is stupidity not error possible? Now, in its French usage, in the pragmatics of the French idiom, which risks Resisting the tradition. On what ground, on what groundless ground does la bêtise open <coughs> and close? I mean the adjective bet and the noun bêtise, which still point to a truth of the meaning. They count with the truth of the meaning, even if this truth, this appearing or this revelation of the meaning can never be reduced to an objective knowledge of the object. The bêtise is always a certain way of not understanding, not being able to explain oneself or to explain, but a not understanding on the order of the analytic comprehension of the meaning, at least of something we call in France, in colloquial, colloquial slang, la comprenue. La comprenue, I don't know how. It's, it's just uh, slang. Comprenure doesn't mean intelligence or comprehension, uh, uh, a way of having an access to something, a meaning that should appear, but the deprivation of la comprenure. It is a manque de comprenure. Pas de savoir, pas forcément d'intelligence, mais de comprenure. So, est-ce que c'est savoir-faire? Is it savoir-faire? I mean, is it like to be savvy? Yeah, that's it. That's what I'm No. But we, I think it would be like savvy. It's the way of uh, uh, not being able to understand, but in the sense of, of understanding which is not epistemological. Um, when you speak, in the everyday life, in the everyday language of someone who stubbornly uh, is, doesn't understand, totally deaf, kind of being deaf, you say, well, open your comprenure, you have to that comprenure, that's just a word of study. Uh, the, the second uh, preliminary remark is this, by staying, saying that stupidity is never the others. La bêtise n'est jamais celle d'autre. By saying that stupidity is never the others, by calling philosophy to modesty, Mandelers says, I quote again, uh, philosophy could have taken up the problem with, with its own means and with the necessary modesty. He suggests that stupidity is at the heart of philosophy which invites philosophy to modesty. And especially, the last implies that stupidity, the possibility of bêtise, is never that of others, because it is always mine or ours. Always on our side. On the side of what is close to me, proper to me, or similar to me, the side of my neighbor, the more semblable, as we say in French. Seulement un semblable, peut-être. That is, 
un aigle, un aigle, un proche, un prochain. C'est une phrase, un prochain, un aigle, un semblable, un autre homme. So it's on my side because it's always on the human side. Uh, now, the word bêtise belongs to the language of indictment because it's a category of accusation, a way of categorizing the other. You know that in Greek, categoria means also, meant also accusation, blame. And with some distance from the Luther's text, he doesn't refer to category in this, in this text. I would add that bêtise, le bête de la bêtise, is a funny category because it is most often manipulated as an accusation, a denigration, an incrimination, but also a misdeed, an offense, an ethical misdeed, or quasi juridical accusation. The category, in the Greek sense, the category of the accusation, is precisely a category whose signification is never assured. It is a category without category in French. It's untranslatable within French itself. Because in each, in every uh, context, in, in every different context, bet or betty functions uh, differently. So you cannot translate bet in a situation into bet in a different situation. The same is true with con. Uh, I would add in parentheses, and uh, with no direct relation to the other text or intention, when he um, uh, mentioned the properly transcendental question of the series, either if there is a category of BTs, it's a category whose meaning cannot be determined, in any case, not as a meaning or sense as such a sense whose conceptual ideality could be translatable and that is and that is distinguished from the idiomatic and pragmatic body of the occurrences. So each time the word bad bitties means something analogous but something different. It is a word that more than any other word means each time something different according to the pragmatic singularities, conscious or unconscious that engage or that engage it or are engaged or involved in it. So Betis is not one category among others. Or it is a trans categorial category. One will never be able to isolate a unifical meaning of a concept of Betis in its irreducible link to the French idiom. Now, if it is a category then bêtise as an accusation and as an attribution, an attribute, a predicate, a predication. If this category doesn't belong to the regime of the normal series of categories, it is an exceptional category, a trans-categorial category. Then it corresponds to the first literal definition uh, of the transcendental in the Middle Age, Middle Ages, long before Kant transcendental man, quid transcendit. Only gilus, which, what transcends all uh, genre, genus. It is a category that transcends all the categories and doesn't belong to the series of tables of categories. So it is, would be, paradoxically enough, in a position of the trans categorial category that is of the transcendental. That's why it deserves the question how is it possible? It is transcendental in this respect of quasi transcendental, and we should, we should draw all the consequences that follow, follow from this. If I have time, I will add a development of Heidegger and the categor categorical here, but I have to turn back to the rest. Saying that stupidity is never the others, Deleuze suggests that stupidity 
is at the heart of philosophy and invites it to modesty. He declares, I repeat, that the possibility of stupidity is never the others because it's mine, it's ours, it's on our side, on the side of the human, of the semblable. Similitude. It looks like me, and I can't assimilate it because it's on my side, which means at least two things. First, uh, and this is a very, very classical uh, uh, problem. Uh, it is, is human and not bestial, not animal, and mutatis mutandis, with this motif of the sambla, the similar, the fellow creature of a betis that is always proper to man. Betis, stupidity, would find an analogous problem, I don't say identical problem, but analogous problem, with that of bestiality, which I treated in the same now with respect to Lacan. Lacan says that bestiality is properly human and not animal. Nevertheless, Deleuze, Deleuze's gesture remains specific. And in order to follow the reasoning that leads him, leads him to say that stupidity is proper to man, is never that of the other, one can follow a trajectory that associates Betis with three motives. One, the figure of sovereignty. So we have here a link with the problem of sovereignty that one calls tyranny. The sovereignty one calls tyranny. Two, with cruelty. And three, what is indispensable to attribute stupidity to man and to understand its link with philosophy, namely stupidity as a problem of thinking, or of thought, of the thinking being that man is, which implies that it's not proper to animality or to the beast. So Betis is a thought, a way of thinking. Betis is thinking. One of the answers to Passage Denken, Betis. It's a thinking and thought freedom. It is in this link of thought with individuation that Deleuze will identify the spring of Betis. Betis is always supposing a relation with what Deleuze called le fond the ground in Schelling's tradition. The Schelling to whom Deleuze refers in the footnote, Schelling, the author of philosophical research on the essence of or the nature of human liberty. I think that one could not understand anything in Deleuze's argumentation on the subject of stupidity, which implies thinking as human freedom in its relation to individuation, as a phenomenon of individuation, Vereinzelung, which is determined on the ground, on the background of the ground, one will understand nothing of this argumentation if one could not reconstitute the whole of Schelling's discourse on freedom and human evil, and notably what Schelling called the ground, the originary ground, Urbund, which is also a non-ground, a groundless ground. Unbund, the Urbund as Unbund. In a moment, I'm going to quote some line by Schelling that Deleuze doesn't quote, but which are visibly the source of his argumentation here, and, as he, and he refers to Schelling in a footnote without quoting him. When Deleuze says that stupidity is, I quote, possible by virtue of the link between thought and individuation, unquote, he distinguishes what is proper to man, stupidity as proper to man. Or again, when he says, I quote, individuation as such, as it operates be beneath all forms, is inseparable from a pure ground that it brings, that it brings to the surface and trails with it. It is difficult to describe this ground or the terror 
and attraction it excites. Turning over the ground is the most dangerous occupation, but also the most tempting in the stupefied moments of an obtuse will. For this ground, along with the individual, rises to the surface, yet assumes neither form nor figure. It is there, staring at us, but without eyes. The individual distinguishes itself from it, but it does not distinguish itself, continu continuing rather to go habit with that which divorces itself from it. It is the indeterminate, but the indeterminate insofar as it continues to embrace determination as the ground does the shoe, as the ground does the shoe. It continues to embrace determination as the ground does the shoe. Comme le sol, la chaussure, le fond, touche la chaussure. So, the animal cannot be bad. That's why Deleuze had written previously, stupidity is not animality, it is. Um, the animal, uh, stupidity, bêtise n'est pas l'animal, n'est pas l'animalité. The animal is protected by specific form which prevents it from being stupid, bad. In other words, the animal cannot be bad, stupid, because it is not free, it has no will, and its individuation, which, give, which, gives it, it, which gives it shape of form, does not appear on the background of a ground, which is freedom itself. Freedom as urgrund and, and un. Just after the passage of individuation, I mentioned a moment ago, Deleuze writes, animals, I quote, animals are in a sense forewarned against this ground protected by their explicit forms. Animals are in a sense forewarned against this ground protected by their explicit form. That page 152, different in the edition. That's why they cannot be bad. But one cannot deny that the phrasing here, the Rosus phrasing, is very vague and empirical. The expression, en quelque sorte, in a sense, animals are in a sense for war against this ground. Les animaux, en quelque sorte, prémunis contre ce fond par le fond des explicites. Animals are in a sense for war against this ground by their explicit forms. This phrasing, <coughs> This phrasing introduces something vague, out of focus, as to the explicitness of a form. At what moment is a form, in a sense, explicit? And finally, what are the forms Deleuze has in mind here when he designates, in such a general and indeterminable fashion, the animals? Who are the animals? Who are the animals? the animal. Couldn't we say that man also has explicit forms that fall on him in a sense against the ground, that is against stupidity? The passage by Schelling concerning the ground that I wanted to quote, and whose principle it seems to me supports or sustains the whole the legend discourse here, can be found in his philosophical research on the essence of nature of human liberty. Schilling is explaining and trying to justify his distinction between being, Wesen, as ground, Grund, and being as existing, existence. So, distinction between Wesen as Grund and Wesen as existence. Discussing this problem, Schelling states that there should be, there should necessarily be a being, Wesen, prior to any ground or any existence. Uh, and thus, in general, prior to any opposition, any duality, he says, I quote, 
how could we call these anything other, we can, as Anders Nennen, anything other than originary ground, then as that then ungrund, other filmer ungrund, other filmer ungrund. How could we call this anything other than originary ground, ungrund, or better, non ground, ungrund, or groundless ground, ground? And he goes on, since it precedes all oppositions, that is for allen gegessen setzen for for her gate, since it precedes all opposition, all oppositions, these oppositions cannot be discerned nor present <coughs> in other way in themselves. It cannot be thus characterized as identity, but only as absolute indifference as to the principle, as to principle, the absolute indifference. So as as can daher nicht as the identity, as can no as the absolute absolute indifference by their bezeichnung werden. Within this logic, which is Schellingian as well as the legend, man takes shape, is determined in his form, on this background of the ground, by keeping with it a relation, a free relation. That's his freedom, a relation to the groundless ground, the Urgund as Urgund which would be denied to animals. To animals who are nevertheless, in a sense, forewarned against, prémunis, the, uh, de le, prémunis, forewarned, contre ce fond, ce fond par la forme explicite, forewarned against this one by their explicit forms. So we should read Schelling again, and Heidegger on Schelling, in particular, what Schelling says on this human sickness, that stupidity, Blödsinn, is. Blödsinn is at the center of the remarkable book by my friend here, Avid Alconel, Stupidity. Uh, <coughs> stupidity, Betty, is the same, exactly the same thing. You know the book. Now, to come back to Deleuze, only this experience of freedom that Betis is, as human freedom, only this freedom that has a relation to the ground as ground can account for the fact that only, not only is Betis foreign to animals, but it may be linked to the three motives I indicated a moment ago, namely sovereignty, cruelty, and thus of evil, disease or sickness, as Schilling would say, sickness, and then thought, thinking. First, sovereignty, the figure of the uh, tyrant, you say, or tyrant? Tyrant. The Leuze note in the passage of Bedi, I quote, I quote, this is why tyrants are the heads not only of beasts, but also of peers, cauliflowers, or potatoes. <laughs> you, you know that, that uh, in, the, in the code, in the lexicon of uh, the American administration, already before Bush, uh, Saddam Hussein was called the beast of Baghdad. The beast of Baghdad. <coughs> uh, I come back to the, the religious quote. This is why tyrants have the, the heads not only of beasts, but also of peers, cauliflowers, or potatoes. One is neither superior nor external to that, to that from which one benefits. The tyrant institutionalizes stupidity, but he is the first servant of his own system and the first to be installed with it. Slaves are always commanded by another slave. This is a very classical, a Catholic one, that tyrants are slaves. Second, evil or cruelty in their essential link to betis, the speciality. Here the last is very eloquent and insistent. What he says is consistent with the gesture that makes Betis the phenomenon of freedom as human freedom. What is remarkable is that the distinction between stupidity and error remains the essential condition for this interpretation of and this problematic. Deleuze writes, how could the concept of error account for this 
unity of stupidity and cruelty, of the grotesque and the terrifying, which gobbles the way of the world. Cowardice, cruelty, baseness, and stupidity are not simply corporeal capacity or traits of character of society. They are, I uh, underline, this is my, my emphasis, they are structures of thought as such. They are structures of thought as such. So, before coming back to the structure of thought, philosophic and transcendental, I underline through some quotations the essential importance that Deleuze attributes to the link between stupidity and cruelty, and thus between stupidity and evil, between stupidity and freedom, between stupidity and responsibility, all traits that are supposed to be human and not animal in the classical tradition. The quote, and the say, all determinations become bad and cruel when they are grasped only by a thought which invents and contemplates them, flayed and separated from their living form, adrift upon this barren ground. Everything becomes violence on this passive ground. Everything becomes attack on this digestive ground. Here the Sabbath of stupidity and malevolence takes place. Perhaps this is the origin of that melancholy which weighs upon the most beautiful human faces. The presentiment of a hideousness, hideousness? hideousness peculiar to the human face, of a rising tide of stupidity and evil deformity, or a thought governed by madness. For from the point of view of the philosophy of nature, madness arises at the point at which the individual contemplates itself in this free ground. And as a result, stupidity in cruelty, stupidity in stupidity, and cruelty in cruelty, to the point that it can no longer stand itself. Quote, by the way, the pitiful faculty then emerges in their mind, that of being able to see stupidity and no longer tolerate it. That's from Flaubert, uh, the picture. It is at that point that Deleuze inserts the footnote that refers to Schelling, which reads as follows, I quote, the, the footnote, Flaubert, Bouvard Picuchet, that's the reference, Schelling, Deleuze goes on, after having mentioned Flaubert, Bouvard Picuchet, Schelling wrote some splendid pages on evil, stupidity and malevolence. Its source, which is like the ground, become autonomous, is, uh, in parentheses, essentially related to the individuation. And, uh, and on the entire history which for, follows from this, in Recherche Philosophique sur la Nature de la Liberté, philosophical research on the nature of the essence of human freedom. Uh, and continuing after the inserted footnote, you will say, it is true that this most pitiful faculty also becomes the royal faculty when it animates philosophy as a philosophy of mind. In other words, when it leads all the other faculties to that transcendent exercise which renders possible a violent reconciliation between the individual, the ground, and thought. And page 152. <coughs> third, then, third point, thought. What is interesting in this structural link that Deleuze sees between bêtise and thought, what he calls the structure of thinking as such, la structure de la pensée comme telle, what is interesting is what he denounces as totally unable to think the thought of bêtise. What he charges or indicts here is the weakness or defect of thought. It is a double figure, a guilty figure of the same sin, the same fault, the same crime. Bad literature, pseudo literature, on the one hand, and on the other hand, philosophy. These are the two faults, the two flaws. Both of them would have missed the essence of Betis the essence of stupidity as a problem of thought. Deleuze will explain why. 
in philosophy and pseudo literature miss stupidity as a thing of thought to the school. The best literature, the meilleur literature, this is the phrase, the meilleur literature, the best literature, even if it doesn't address thematically or systematically the stupidity of thought, stupidity as a structure of thought, the best literature is haunted, as Deleuze's word, is haunted by stupidity. The best literature is haunted by stupidity. It is haunted by, I quote again, the problem of stupidity. Deleuze thereby introduces the spectral lexicon of haunting that will carry the equivocal charge of the difference between pseudo-literature and philosophy on the one hand, and the best literature on the other hand. How can we visualize this haunting? What are the signs, positive, negative, the negative, denials, presence of symptoms, absence of symptoms, explicit or in implicit thematization, to what degree, and so on? Deleuze writes, Deleuze writes, the transcendental landscape comes to life. Places for the tyrant, the slave, and the imbecile, imbecile? imbecile. imbecile must be found within it, without the place resembling the figure with, who occupies it, and without the transcendental ever being traced from the empirical figure which it makes possible. It is always our belief in the postulates of the cogitatio, which prevents us from making stupidity a transcendental problem. Stupidity can then be no more than an empirical determination, referring back to psychology or to the anecdotal, or words to polemics and insults. So he wants to to uh, re uh, to uh, restore <coughs> the, the, the transcendental dignity of the problem of stupidity. It's not uh, empirical or uh, anecdotal. Polemic and insult and to the especially atrocious, atrocious pseudo-literary genre of the sautisier, we call it sautisier in France, in French uh, a collection of stupidities, bêtises. But whose fault is this, he continues? Does not the fault lie first with philosophy, which has allowed itself to be convinced by the concept of error, even though this concept is itself borrowed from facts, relatively insignificant and arbitrary facts, the worst literature produces sautisier, while the best, Flaubert, Baudelaire, Blois, was haunted by the problem of stupidity. By giving this problem all its cosmic, encyclopedic, and nosological dimensions, such literature was able to carry it as far as the entrance to philosophy <coughs> itself as far as the entrance to philosophy itself. So the best literature, on so the one hand you have bad literature and philosophy, and on the other hand, the <coughs> best literature which introduces to philosophy, which is on the threshold of what philosophy should be. Yeah? Now on the other hand, to say that stupidity is never stupidity of the other, does it mean only that it is always reserved for my fellow creatures, mes semblables, as human beings? It means also that I, the I as a philosopher, or a theoretician, or not, always risk being compelled to attribute stupidity to myself, the I to which I refer, or the stupidity that I, that I think automatically, in a stupid manner, bêtement, that I identify in others. Here, to follow this, to interpret Deleuze's intention, we could follow Flaubert, Flaubert's tracks, and of course, Deleuze refers to it also. But let me get to my conclusion. <coughs> I'm not saying this in order to discredit discourses that do whatever they can to specify as much as possible the humanity, the properly human character of bestiality. Speciality is something human. Ou bêtise, Deleuze. Bêtise is human. 
I'm not saying this in order to confuse humans with animals, of course, to say that there is no difference between human animals and, and non-human animals. On the contrary, it's in order to refine the differential concepts that I underline a certain non-pertinence of the concept and of the logic that are, that are put to work here in order to reserve the privilege of, one, of what one thinks one can define as human bestiality and human betis, stupidity. That is to reserve these to the properly human animality, supposed to be free and responsible and not reactive, able to discern between good and evil, able to do evil for the sake of evil, and so on. I would like to conclude by specifying my reading of the original form that this tradition takes in Deleuze, because Deleuze is still traditional from that point of view, whatever his originality might be from another point of view. I think that Deleuze both belongs to this tradition and on the background of this tradition remains original, or original if you want. When in the Schillingian vein that I recall, Deleuze says, la bêtise n'est pas d'animalité, stupidity is not animality, or the animals are innocent, forewarned against this background by their explicit forms, he implies that man even where his form, the, ter the, the determination of his individuation, protects itself against the groundless ground, the Urgrund as Ungrund, man remains nevertheless as an undetermined freedom in relation with this groundless ground. And that's where, according to him, this properly human possibility, stability, comes from. But what permits saying this in this form. Let's re-examine the statement. Les animaux sont en quelque sorte prémunis contre ce fond par leurs formes explicites. And I underline, en quelque sorte prémunis et formes explicites. If they are prémunis, forewarned, it means that they are in relation, they have some relation with this ground and they are under the threat of this ground. Of course, what is often tempted to see, with respect to many animals, a relation to the groundless ground, of course. A relation more fascinating and fascinated, anxious and abyssal, as abyssal as with men. Even if, even in what would forward or protect them, we can feel a proximity, an obsessing threatening proximity of this ground against which, but like humans, against which animals like humans would protect themselves. Moreover, when Deleuze, in such a sharp fashion, wants to separate man from animals, as to betis, by saying in a determined and decided fashion, la betis n'est pas l'animalité, why does he introduce phrases that are so resistant to sharp opposition, such as en quelque sorte, in a sense, or for one, prémuni, prémuni, what does it mean, prémuni? Protected in some sense, but to what extent, what sense? En quelque sorte, a notion, uh, prémuni or for one, en quelque sorte, that notion that implies a degree, and again, the problem of immunity, which I, I take uh, very seriously in, in other texts of uh, autoimmunity. There is always a degree of more or less, more or less protection against <coughs> something to which one remains related, or a more or less of protection. The way some animals sense the coming of an earthquake that remains imperceptible to man. Above all, what could be, what could we do with a phrase like forms explicit? What does that mean, form explicit? What about implicit forms? So this question of the implicit, of the difference implicit-explicit, not only opens on gradations, a differentiality without opposition, with no opposition, a gradation of more or less 
but also opens on the question of the unconscious. That's why I started with psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is a space where, of course, I admire Deleuze and where I also have some resistance to him. The question of the unconscious, which doesn't appear at all in this context, Deleuze quickly will have dismissed the way Lacan himself does when he says that bestiality is not animal, and when he says that the animal has no unconscious. I could demonstrate this through a number of Lacan texts that I can't do this now. The animal has no unconscious. Even the unconscious of man, repression and resistance, are not taken into account in this Deleuzean analysis of the teeth and the protection against the unquote control. It is at this point, however, funny and necessary sometimes, that Deleuze's ironical vigilance is sarcasm as two psychologists. At this point, it's difficult for me to laugh with him for too long. Why should we not recognize? Why should we not conversely say conversely that to the extent that he also has explicit forms of individuation, man protects himself against the ground as common. To that extent, at least following the religious logic, man would ignore pure stupidity as the animal does, without homogenizing the things, without wanting to erase differences, I believe that the conceptuality just analyzed here does not provide any assured criteria to propose in such, in such a decisive way that la bêtise n'est pas l'animal, and that only man is exposed to stupidity. For example, in the following sentences in Berlioz's text, I don't see why the equivocal figures of minar, I don't know how to translate this, minar, which relates to the ground, to the underground. Miné in French means the, the mine. The, uh, the you go to, the, to, to, to dig. In the burrow. The burrow to, to dig in the, in the underground. And the work of minar and of travail are being worked by, or travaillé par couldn't apply to animals, unless one supposes with Descartes and Kant that the animal cannot constitute itself as an I. That's a constant prevailing belief with philosophers, mm -hmm. that the difference between animals, animal and man, between animality and humanity, is that the animal cannot say I. But also with anthropology, that the essence of what is proper to man is circumscribed by the possibility of saying I, even the ability, the power to say me, I. And this is a question I would have liked to develop, but we have to leave aside for now and make do with a sketch of how I would approach it. I quote again, uh, same passage by the word. Animals are in a sense forewarned against this ground, protected by their explicit form, not so for the I and the self, undermined by the fields of individuation which work beneath them, defenseless against a rising of the ground which holds up to them a distorted or distorting mirror in which all presently thought forms dissolve. Stupidity in neither the ground nor the individual, but rather this relation in which individuation brings the ground to the surface without being able to give it form. Parenthesis, this ground rises by means of the eye, of the eye, penetrating deeply into the possibility of thought and constituting the unrecognized in every recognition. That's exactly the culture. And even the culture. This amount to saying that stupidity is the eye. The ego is the thing of the eye the ego. It avoids naming something in the form of a psychic life that we could call ground or not, that we wouldn't have the figure of the eye, without having to credit such or such construction of further metapsychology, which I don't. One cannot reduce the whole 
psychological or metapsychological experience to, to its egological form. And one cannot reduce all life to the ego, nor every egological structure to the conscious I. In the psychological or phenomenological <coughs> experience, in the self-relation of the living being, the relation of the living being to itself, the originality of the way Deleuze asks this question, I think these pages of difference and repetition belong to this tradition. It may surprise us when this distinction appears in the discourse on the side of Lacan that is produced in the name of, of psychoanalysis in the return to Freud, or in the discourse such as Deleuze's, who speaks of a production of the unconscious. In both cases, at least, they admit the possibility of the unconscious. And I think this philosophy of Betis is inconsistent with this reference to the unconscious. But at that point, one doesn't need the word unconscious, nor any theoretical or metapsychological construction. The I, the id, the super ego, uh, the ideal ego, the ideal of the ego, not the real, the symbolic of the imaginary of the I as in Lacan. It is enough that the minimal condition that we take into account the divisibility, the multiplicity, or differences of forces in a living being, whatever it may be. It is enough to admit that there is no finite living, living being, human or non-human, that wouldn't be structured by this differential of forces between, it, between which the tension, if not a contradiction, cannot locate or be located in different instances, apparatuses, if you will, one resisting others, one repressing or suppressing others, or trying to push forward or make prevail what La Fontaine in his The Wolf and the Sheep called La Raison du Plus Fort, the reason or the right of the strongest. In these antagonisms, made possible in every finite living being, made possible by differences of forces and intensities, stupidity is always necessarily on both sides. On the side of the who, man, ego, if you want, and on the side of the what, the side of what happens to the one who poses himself as a sovereign, free, etc., or on the side of what the free ego or sovereign denounces are, or attacks of the stupidity of the other. If I had time, I would move from Deleuze to Flaubert and to Valéry and Monsieur Test when he says, again, untranslatably, la bêtise n'est pas mon fort. <laughs> uh, impossible to translate. Uh, it's translated as, I'm not strong on stupidity. Uh, and, uh, and I would have, have uh, insisted on <coughs> how stupid one would be to say, la bêtise n'est pas mon fort. Thank you. Mm -hmm.